I'll, I'll just touch on for a moment uh, the metabolic syndrome in Syndrome X, only because it's out there in, um, in the media all the time. And Syndrome X is really exactly what that says. It's a constellation of risk factors that we know predisposes people to heart disease and insulin resistance. And the way we measure uh, metabolic syndrome these days is you have to have one of these measures, which is overweight or central obesity. It's at least one factor, and you have to have two of the others. So if you've got a dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia means a problem with cholesterol or triglycerides, which are body fats, insulin resistance, or a past history of um, anyone in the family having diabetes, or you having had some form of diabetes, including gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is the diabetes you get when you're pregnant, and it seems to disappear. And we used to think that it was just bad luck and increased um, in, in, increased load on, on the patient during uh, the pregnancy, which it is. But the risk of developing real diabetes after having gestational diabetes is about 50%, one in two. So um, it's something you need to be aware of and look at if you've had that. And high blood pressure. Why do we worry about metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is very important because it increases your risk of all of these things we haven't bothered to put on. But these are the big ones coronary heart disease, stroke, digestive diseases, certain cancers, gallbladder disease and polycystic ovaries. All the things that you don't really want. <coughs> there are lots of influences on metabolism. And I'm not going to bother with too many of them, but let's just say that age, a lot of people think that as they get older, their metabolic rate drops significantly. Well, it does drop, but not nearly as much as you think. It drops by about 2% per decade after the age of 30. So it's really not the ageing process that causes the drop in metabolism. It's the change in lifestyle. So many people, uh, when they take on sedentary jobs, when they stop going to school, university or whatever, or get married and become very well fed and, and so on and don't go out as much quite often, tend to gain weight very rapidly and it relates to their metabolism but not their age. But crash dieting is probably worth mentioning. Crash dieting has a profound effect on metabolism. It actually drops it significantly. So if you go on a crash diet and try to lose weight very rapidly, your metabolic rate will drop and therefore when you regain the weight, it doesn't take that much to regain the weight. You've probably heard this, the concept of um, dieting makes you fat, which seems to be a contradiction in terms. But the reason that does make you fat, and it does, is because when you lose weight as a rule, you lose fat, but you also lose lean muscle tissue, which is muscle. When you regain the weight, the majority of people will regain fat only. So with each cycle of losing fat and muscle, regaining fat, fat and muscle, regaining fat, the percentage of body fat increases. And so you become much less metabolically active. So if you're going to be a person who crash diets or diets aggressively and then regains it, you're better off not dieting at all. Keep that in mind. Now, the body does not like you losing weight. And it does all sorts of things to stop you losing weight. The metabolic rate drops, uh, you start conserving certain tissues, and it's very important to realise that regardless of what you do, even if you go on the strictest of diets, you will always have a plateau. And that's where people get frustrated. They'll have terrific weight losses initially, and they'll go, they'll go through their first plateau, and they'll throw their hands up in the air, and they say, that's the end, I can't lose weight, and start feeding again. The fact is you have to accept this because your body treats rapid weight loss as a threat to its existence. So if it thinks it's losing too much weight, it'll cut back on energy, it'll drop the metabolic rate, it'll make you hungrier and you'll find it tough. But if you crash through this, it will improve. So you just have to persevere because even if you were to have nothing or if you were to go on a 500 calorie diet, if we count calories, you will still go through plateaus. They're unavoidable because this is just your body's protective um, feature. 
I'll just skip over some of the nutrients because all of these nutrients have an impact in, in the way that um, you lose weight. And we'll, we'll talk about certain things like fats, proteins, carbohydrates and so on. And we'll touch on fats first because fats used to be the bad boys on the block many years ago. And then they lost their reputation for being that bad, but they still deserve it. And fats are bad for you as a rule for these reasons. One, they're very energy dense. That means there are a lot of calories in a very small amount of food. Secondly, they're non-satiating. It means they don't fill you. They actually stimulate your appetite. So people think that fats make you full, but they don't. If you go to a lot of restaurants, they actually add fat and salt to the food to make you hungry and thirstier. The big problem these days, and certainly for the last 10 or 20 years, is a lot of the fats are hidden and unseen. And many of the pre-prepared foods that you're eating have got enormous amounts of fat in them. And you have to learn to read labels. It's a real issue. And one of the reasons, and I'll, I'll, I'll break one of these um, um, big lies that are out there. One of the reasons that you're getting a lot of fat in your food and you don't realise it is because several decades, several decades ago, uh, some very clever food scientists found that if you add certain oils, certain fats, to your food, it actually increases the shelf life. Uh, and therefore, if you add these particular fats to the food, the shelf life increases, but the people who buy them die prematurely. Uh, but the profit margin is better and therefore they're there all the time. And so you have to learn, and I'm serious about this, you have to learn to read labels because 40 or 50 years ago most of the uh, saturated fats, the bad fats you were having, were coming from red meat and high fat dairy. These days they're coming uh, in a lot of your pre-prepared foods, pastries, salamis, things like that. Be very aware of it and start reading labels. We certainly should talk about trans fats for those of you who don't know about them. But fats are broken into three areas. Saturated fats, which are the bad fats. <coughs> Monounsaturated or unsaturated fats, which are the good fats. And trans fats, which are the ugly, horrible, very, very bad fats. And trans fats, to put it very simply, are the fats that are totally unnatural. They're fats that are usually liquid at room temperature, that are treated with heat, pressure, and hydrogen to turn them into solids at room temperature. The process is called hydrogenation. The classic example of the original trans fat is margarine. Margarine, the real margarine, is a trans fat. And in the, early, uh, in the early days, I think 30s or 40s, I think it was during the Second World War, it became popular because dairy became very scarce. Um, margarine was produced, but you have to realise margarine is basically lard, an artificial fat, and it looks white and opaque. It's coloured yellow to make it look like butter. And there was vicious debate for many years uh, in the States about allowing them to paint it yellow uh, with dyes because they didn't want them to think that it was uh, butter. And after about five or ten years they finally were allowed to do so. And so anything that's a heated fat at high temperature, things that are boiled in fat like chips and things like that for long periods of time create trans fats. Trans fats are so bad for you that in some countries like um, Denmark if you have a trans fat content of 2% or more in the food, it's illegal. In Australia, we're just now starting to label it. So you're eating food here that would be illegal to be sold in certain other places. And I think Southern California is doing that as well.